the deadly strontium octave reaches the tremendous pressure of 16,777,216, and the barium octave reaches 134,217,728 pressures. Underground, these tremendous explosive pressures give birth to lower pressures by releasing higher ones from crystallized, crystallized structures. That is the cyclic or reincarnation process of nature. Above ground, however, the cycle acts in reverse. Dead bodies kill living bodies instead of burning them. That is why oxygen and the free radioactive metals cannot coexist. That is why thousands of tons of radioactive death in plutonium, strontium, thorium, radium, and the other nearly dead elements used in reactor plants and discarded as waste will gradually consume the Earth's atmosphere and its oceans, if not prevented from allowing the dead to remain buried instead of resurrecting it to kill the living. We must understand that all bodies beyond carbon are dying bodies and that living bodies cannot live by consuming dead ones. There is a point of decay in all bodies, whether they are carrots, meat, fruit, oxygen, or nitrogen. You do not have to be convinced that you cannot live if you consume decaying bodies of vegetables or animals, which are composed of nitrogen, oxygen, and carbon. Why should it be necessary to convince you that you cannot live if you consume decaying oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon in their natural forms? Decay and radioactivity are one, except that radioactivity is fast decay. Pressures in electric matter are dominated by the geometry of space wave fields, which are based upon the cube. We recite this fact in passing to explain the use of the word, but its further explanation would require too much space to record here. We will lightly touch upon it at the end of this book, however. You can better understand the death-dealing speed of radioactive light bullets which radium or plutonium can shoot at you if you but compare the speed and power of colonial musket bullets to the modern ones and then multiply that by thousands of times. Or if you put 60 pounds of pressure in your tire instead of 30 and compare the hiss of that explosion when you open the valve with the hiss of a 30 pound pressure, it will give you a more clear picture of what over a billion times 30 pounds would do if you could blow up a tire to such a high pressure. Let us now enter our house of safety within which our environment is all contributory to the well-being of organic life. By organic life we mean oxygen-dependent bodies. Within that triangle on the universal harp are only five of its tones out of its total 121. Those five tones are carbon, silicon, oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen. It will probably amaze you to be informed that four of these five elements constitute 981 and no, 98 and one half percent of your whole body composition. More amazing still, all five constitute 98 and one half percent of the upper few feet of the Earth's crust upon which your body is dependent for the food it needs for survival. The basic constituent of animal bodies is carbon, while the ba basis constituent for the fertile life-giving Earth's crust is silicon. Silicon is the first stage of death for carbon. It is therefore as good for purposes of Earth as carbon is for purposes of life. Our bodies need many metals, but it is extremely important to realize two things about such needs. One is that out of the many, their total is 
one and a half percent of our bodies. The other is that not even a millionth of a milligram of metal enters the body in its free, free state. They can be present only as mineral salts or oxides, iron, calcium, magnesium, sodium, and many other mineral salts are necessary, but only in infinitesimal amounts. To indicate the small amounts of metals the body will accept, we cite such examples as manganese, which is present in only seven hundredths of one percent, copper one thousandth, nickel two ten thousandth, and gallium three one hundred thousandth of one percent. Iron, calcium, iodine, sodium, and other metal salts are necessary also, but in extremely small fractions. This seems a very strange thing, for nature creates only metals. The textbooks give list of non-metals, but there are no non-metals. All stone in this universe is composed of one or more pairs of metals in union. The stone of which your grindstone is made is the main source of alunium, but the mate of alunium is phosphorus. Likewise, the stony carbon is composed of boron and nitrogen in union. Nitrogen is classified as a gas, but all gases are low-pressured metals. The next octave above nitrogen is phosphorus. It has been multiplied into a solid by one octave of additional pressure. Nitrogen and oxygen are good friends in the atmosphere we breathe but phosphorus will burst into flame and consume oxygen if exposed to it, and if we breathe it, we would die, yet it is but concentrated or compressed nitrogen. If you multiply nitrogen another octave, the result is arsenic, and that is obviously a metal. If you breathe arsenic vapors or take in a very little of it into your body, even as a salt, it will kill you quickly. Yet that too is but compressed nitrogen. Every gas and dense element of every octave becomes an obvious metal when multiplied into higher octaves, and therein lies one of the reasons why organic life is possible only by keeping within the limits defined by the triangle on the map herein given. We will take this for the next step, the as yet unknown fact that the structure of the universe as one whole body lives and grows to maturity, then dies just as man and all organic life does. Carefully note the parallel. A man matures at about 40, which is about one half of his cycle. During all of the period of time, he is growing stronger and is more vital. From that moment, however, he begins to die. His genero-active maximum is reached, and his radioactive period begins. He may still grow stronger in body, but his cells are dying faster than he can keep them regenerated. When he is about 80, death has caught up with the power which charges bodies into life. The why of that is what you need to know for, for your own sake, and why the why of the death of metals is what atomic engineers must know. The entire birth and growth of matter matures at carbon. It matures as a flaming true sphere, any part of which will crystallize as a true cube when frozen into form. The cold cube of space and the hot sphere of matter are the consummate forms of nature. Beyond that, they cannot go. Also, they are nature's limitations in pressures, temperatures, and frequencies. Beyond the cube and the sphere, they cannot go. When you understand this fundamental of nature, you will then understand why and how you and all things live, and why and how you die. Follow this explanation carefully, then, and you will know as to where you go when you die, 
that can wait. But that also you will know before you finish this book. We will leave this idea of cube spear limitation and its reversal for a moment, but we'll return. Now look at your chart and find carbon in the fourth octave, symbolized by a cube centering a sun. From that point on, death begins and multiplies its power to die in the same ratio as it has multiplied its power to live. In other words, it now accumulates as much centrifugal speed to disappear into its invisible source as it accumulated centrifugal speed on its way to its destination in carbon. The only difference is that the general active speed of compression is inward from the outside until maturity in carbon and after that it is radioactive speed explodes outward from the inside. In each case the inward speed of 186,400 miles per second is reached at the maximum point of life in carbon and the outward speed is reached at the amplitude of the ninth octave just beyond the transuranium elements, which is the maximum point of universal death. What we have just stated is one of the most significant facts of nature. It has never been known because it has never been known that the universe lives and dies, just as man lives and dies. Nor has it been known that bodies live by fast motion and also die by fast motion. All through this book, you will never lose sight of that fact, for it runs through the book like a golden thread in a tapestry, as it does all through nature. You must fully understand that electric compression continues to generate after carbon has been reached and death has begun to find supremacy, just as a 40-year-old man may still become stronger and more vital after he has begun to die. If you examine these elements beyond carbon, you will find that they are more dense. All, they all, you will find that they are all more dense and much more heavy than any element up to and including carbon. Plutonium is the heaviest of all elements. It is also the greatest of the 22 killer metals. These killer metals are what atomic energy is in tending to release into our atmosphere. We will now explain why killer metals kill and why other metals do not kill. God the Creator is light, the invisible white light of the undivided and unchanging magnetic universe. In God's creation, He limits all motion to that point in compression where invisible white light has been reached between the two visible yellows of flame in fission state. When a sun has become a true sphere, its center has reached the white invisible still point in the spectrum where motion has ceased. Up to that very point, the inward speed of compression has multiplied to its limit of 186,400 miles per second. At that point also the sun has reached its maximum temperature. At that point also there is but one center of gravity. Until then there are two. White light is always invisible, for it is always still. It could not be white otherwise. Any motion whatsoever would be visible as yellow. The point which we wish to emphasize by the above is that when general activity has created a true sphere. It also has created within it a white light of gravity to center it. It has also created its maximum speed and maximum temperature. It can go no farther. The Creator has consumed His creation. He has given all He has to give. One half of His law of love has been fulfilled. Up to that point, the Einstein equation of 1905 fits perfectly. It fully accounts for the mathematics of life, but not for death. The other half of the law of love must now be fulfilled. That which has been given must be equally re-given. 
the balance rhythm of this universe must not be upset. For this reason, that which has been must be repeated in reverse to void that which has been. For neither life nor death can end or begin. They can only be repeated, and when they are repeated, they do so through each other. You now have taken another big step in comprehending the difference between slow normal death and quick radioactive death. We must again hold this ideal in suspense for a time, as it has many angles and facets which are better to be completed together, as a good diamond cutter does, instead of trying to complete one at a time. The next step, step for comprehension brings two words into our story, which are of great import. These words are centrifugal and centrifugal. Their real office in nature has not yet been known, other than the fact that one supposedly contracts from the inside, which is not true, and the other expands. What is not yet understood is the fact that centrifugal spiral motion in this entire universe is expressed where pairs of central fetal pairs meet in sex union in nature's electric current and began the journey of re-giving back to the giver of motion. If this fact had been known, there would have been no expanding universe theory. The textbooks say that there is no uphill flow of energy. Centrifugal motion is that uphill flow. The cyclone vortex, vortex is that uphill flow. The winding of the universal clock spring is that uphill flow. The charging of your battery, your body, and the creative process of compression is that uphill flow. Nature creates atom units centrifugally to mate in mated pairs. She causes atom unit pairs to collide and explode. There are not any atomic systems in nature until mated pairs meet in sex union at wave amplitudes. <clears throat> <coughs> Look into the heavens. Every spinning spiral nebula is an atomic system on a stellar scale. It is made up of the dying parts of a united pair which has arrived at its centrifugal maximum and must begin its dissolving journey back to its source. That dissolution is expressed by rings, which wind up into spears. These spears throw off more rings centrifugally until all wound-up matter has been unwound. Centrifugal motion is the outward direction of death. Radioactivity is centrifugal. The power to kill, which has been generated in the 22 radioactive killer metals, is due to the intensively high pressure which has been compressed into them beyond their ability to hold. As a result, they discharge their death rays in metal bullets for the thousands of years they consume in their dying. These metal bullets are as potent in killing you as bullets discharged from a revolver, and the principle of their projection is the same. The only difference is that radioactive bullets are so ultramicroscopic that five billions of them would not make up a pinhead in size, but their expanding power within your body more than makes up for their smallness. In fact, their power to expand within your cells is their danger, for expanding cells are dying cells. We will pause again to examine these bullets so that you will get a very clear idea of their potency and know also that it would be an, an, as impossible for you to be protected from them as it would be impossible to protect you from feeling the effects of the sun. Let us therefore first examine radium expansion bullets. We again refer you to your nine-stringed cosmic harp. You will find radium on the ninth string. Remember that all bodies are, di are dying from the fifth string to the ninth, although they are trying very hard to live. Look at carbon, 
with that thought in mind. Imagine its relationship to matured life such as you would find in a viral athlete of 40. Its cube crystal form indicates its perfection of body. Now look at silicon on the fifth ring string. The athlete is now a virile man of 50, but not his equal of 10 years ago. Silicon and silicates can reach amplitude and the hexagon in crystal structure, but cannot reach the balanced cube. <clears throat> now look at the sixth and seventh string. The athlete is dying with great spasmodic efforts to live. He can never reach amplitude again, however. Carbon was enabled to void its metallic quality by the union of a pair. In the sixth and seventh octaves, however, that amplitude collision is not consummated, even though five terrific efforts are made to accomplish it. The yield has been but five pairs of metals, and their inability to create a spear with one center of gravity instead of five pairs of centers, has yielded the high-pressured metals known as cobalt in the sixth octave and rhodium in the seventh. By the seventh octave, the effort to live becomes greater. That tremendous effort to compress multiplies the power to die. Thirteen efforts in pairs are made in the eighth octave with the yield of a prototype of cobalt known as lutetium. You may study all of these pairs of metals by examining the Russell periodic chart number one. <clears throat> In the radium octave, these pairs of efforts are detectable on the red side of the spectrum, but not on the blue side, for reasons which would occupy too much space to tell here, and not sufficiently necessary to this story. As a part of it, however, take note that all of the worst radioactive killer metals are on the red side. Now, as to radium, what is it? Let us examine its ancestry. Beryllium in the fourth octave, which has a pressure intensity of 32,768, begat magnesium, which has an explosive pressure intensity of 262,144. Magnesium begat calcium, which has an explosive pressure of 2,097,152. Calcium begat strontium at 16,777,216 units of pressure. Strontium begat barium at 134,217,728, and barium begat radium, which has accumulated the enormous power to eject its bullets of 1,073,741,824 times that which it had at birth nine octaves back. Your greatest comprehension of the deadliness of the radioactive elements can come by the study of radium. We cite radium, for you can very easily visualize its deadliness by purchasing a little inexpensive instrument called a spintheroscope at any op opti opticians for about three dollars. Well, that was back then. Within it is a fine needle which has touched a long, empty, supposedly used up small vial of that very expensive radium. We cite this fact to drive home to you the potency of so inconceivably an element as inconceivable an element as this, which cannot seemingly ever be used up. It may be that several hundred thousand more spintheroscopes can still be made from that empty vial. If you look through the lens toward a fluorescent screen, you will see a sight so glorious that it could not be matched except by looking through a telescope at a star cluster. Thousands of stars seem to be exploding against that screen. 
What you see are the death rays of one of the most poisonous of the radioactive elements. You are seeing the luminous metallic expansion bullets, which leave their metallic quality in their target to continue their expansion and pass through and beyond it into inert gas, an inert gas named niton, then through another named xenon, then through another named krypton, and another named argon, and still another named neon, until it finds its final resting place in helium. In passing through all these, they have expanded them all to get back to the low pressures of the fourth octave. Further description of this principle must be deferred until the inert gases can be more fully explained in Chapter 11. We can add, however, that plutonium bullets are not content to stop at helium. They continue right through to the inert gas of the beginning of creation in Octave 1. The wonderful an amazing fact of this little instrument is that you could still see it as it now is for thousands of years. That fact should answer for you the question as to the ability of man to protect you from, its, from it after thousands of tons of the still more deadly plutonium are distributed all over the country in solid 10-ton piles and not just in the scrapings of an empty milligram vial. An interesting story is told about radium when it was first discovered. For a while it was thought that the life principle had at last been found. This was so sincerely believed that instruments were made to charge drinking water with these life-giving rays. Such instruments were purchased by the wealthy for, a, for as high as $1,000. Very soon, however, the tragic era was discovered before it became serious. Today, however, the danger is well known that the number of seconds in which one is exposed to X-rays or any radioactive effect are checked and counted to prevent too much exposure to these now known death rays. In closing the description of radium, we feel that your decision as to whether or not you can be protected from its dangers would be affected by the following story of the tragedy which resulted from a slight accident in a laboratory, which we are quoting from an article from Collier's. Such things are impossible to prevent. In reading it, remember that it is only radium, the lesser radioactive element in that octave. That might also happen with plutonium, which is many times stronger. A graphic example of how fast and far contamination can spread occurred a few years ago when someone in a Navy laboratory on Treasure Island in San Francisco Bay stepped on a glass vial containing a barely visible amount of radium salt. The accident was discovered late in the afternoon, and by the time decontamination crews got on the job 16 hours later, the radium had already spread through the San Francisco area for a radius of 20 miles. Automobiles used by students and instructors in the lab were heavily contaminated, especially the steering wheels and the floor mats. Their homes were jumping with radioactivity. It was uncanny, recalls Lieutenant Commander Royce Scowl, who directed much of the decontamination work. With our instruments, we could trace the movements of the men just as though their tracks were visible. A sofa showed the outline of a student's body where he had laid down. We traced one young father from his living room to his child's crib. Two hot spots showed where he had put his hand on the railing of the crib. In a typical home seven miles from the laboratory, a student had contaminated doorknobs, towels, and water faucets. His bedspread and pillow, his slippers, his armchair a writing desk, and his pencils, his clothes, all showed radioactivity. Since the contamination had spread outside the laboratory, where it could have been handled more effectively, drastic measures were called for. Decontamination teams ripped out carpets from a dozen homes. Automobile mats and seat covers were junked. 